We're very happy today. We're very happy today to have Renato speak to us. Um, I held her down and forced her to volunteer. Um, no, she volunteered very easily. <laughs> Um, so Renato is at the University of Pretoria with me. She is a part-time lecturer with us. She's currently busy with her PhD in mathematical statistics, and she's been with us since her undergrad. So she did a BSc maths as undergrad, but she knew already then that she was going to go into something spatial. And she also did some GIS and spatial module modules at undergrad level, which is actually quite uh, unique. Most of our students will be doing maths and math stats or ACTI and that sort of thing. And she sort of just followed her passion and she added that to her degree. And then she did a BSc honors math stats with us and then a master's math stats. And now she's busy doing her PhD. Interesting trend. Yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> um, Renata has worked, uh, her speciality is spatial stats, but she's um, with very applied direction. So she's been working on, on road detection in her honors and masters and still you'll see from a talk very much on a network type of direction. Um, specifically in, in her honors and masters, we've developed a, a road detection algorithm for informal roads. So our roads in our informal settlements between the shacks, footpaths, those sort of things that are really important for sustainable development and capacity and access to um, facilities such as hospitals and say vaccination stations and all sorts of things like that for people living in, in those sorts of environments. Um, and she's now busy with her PhD. She's not doing so much the road detection, but we do, we're still busy with another research team on the side with that. But she's working specifically with networks uh, in her PhD. And she has worked very uh, um, in depth on some packages in R in, in this direction. And when she was showing it to me, I thought this is really something that would be interesting for a lot of people. Uh, this SF Networks package is very, very exciting, very, very new, um, but very sort of going in the right direction of spatial stats and data science and using R for all of our analysis. Um, so I think you will really enjoy it. So Renata is a colleague of mine as well, and I'm very honored to have her as a colleague and a co-lecturer. And a, and a friend. <laughs> and, and Renata also on the side is an author. Some of us can't write. I know I'm one of them. Renata can write. So if you want to talk about cool scientific novels and not scientific novels, fantasy and creative things, then Renata is your person. Um, and she also runs and hikes and does all sorts of cool things as well in her spare time because we have a lot of that. Hey, Renata. <laughs> A lot, there's a lot of spare time if you don't sleep. Yes, exactly. I mean, who needs to sleep? That's really not entirely necessary. <laughs> right, I'll hand over to you, Renata. We're really looking forward to it. Thank you very much for volunteering to speak today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for um, inviting me with no obligation. <laughs> right, so we'll see if PowerPoint blesses me today. I would like to make this. There we go. Full screen. Okay, so thank you so much, Inga, for the uh, lovely introduction. I don't have uh, much else to add. Um, I'll just mention that I'm a big fan of open source, free, open software and data, which is why I'm really happy about R and really excited about SF Networks and any other packages that help to make R even more useful than it already is. And I also um, really like using QGIS, which I will be demonstrating for like two seconds um, during this presentation as well. It's a um, open source software. It's it's like R in that regard, and they do um, they are used together a lot. QGIS is for visualizing um, spatial data. Okay, so brief outline of today's talk. I'm going to explain the problem statement. So basically motivating why we need SF networks, then I'll show where SF networks comes in. Um, and so that item number two is the big one. I'll explain where SF networks comes in in the presentation, and then I'll also demonstrate it. I've got a fully worked out example. And then I'll finish off with some links and resources for SF networks. Okay, so 
the problem statement behind SF networks is that we want to analyze road networks. So it's for routing, it's for calculating distance, it's for calculating um, accessibility and centrality. So that's, for instance, if you want to um, open up a new Burger King and you want to check whether there's maybe already a bunch of McDonald's in the area, then maybe you want to put your Burger King shop somewhere else. Um, it can be for planning hospitals, um, for instance, in, um, in Gauteng province specifically, our hospitals are really well placed spatially, but it's that's not to say that everyone has access to them, um, depending on the transport network, depending on how far they have to travel, the condition of the roads and that kind of thing. So you can't just look at an image of a city from above and say, okay, well, there's a bunch of houses here, let me put a hospital there, because maybe the houses are there, but there's no road leading to where you want to put the hospital and that kind of thing. So there are already packages in R that allow us to work with spatial data. Um, and one of these really popular ones is SF. Um, I've just quoted the sort of definition of SF there. It represents simple features as records in a data frame with a geometry list column. And it's a really great package, but it doesn't allow for um, connectivity. It, it doesn't capture road connectivity. Um, you can't do graph type calculations on it. It literally just gives you the, for instance, the name of the road and then the geometry of the road. So you know how long it is, but you don't know if it connects to any other roads. Um, even if there are two roads crossing each other that are both SF objects, there's no mechanism of actually capturing the fact that they intersect um, or doing analysis with that. Then there are also um, packages that allow us to work with graphs. iGraph is the big one. And that's all about connections between points of interest, um, but it's not spatial. So here I've got an example of how SF might um, represent a road network. So the road network structure is actually from this um, GitHub link at the bottom. I will also be going there um, at some point during the presentation. So this is the one of the guys who developed it, is this Luke van der Meer guy. Um, and he and his team have done a really great job. The vignettes and articles that they've made that explain how to use SF networks are comprehensive and they're so easy to read. They're just really great. Um, there's a lot of code in there, um, among others, the code that I used to plot this network. So this is a sort of SF type representation you can see that there are lines, we can see that they connect, but the fact that they connect is not represented or captured in any way. Then this is how iGraph would, re would represent literally exactly this network. This is the same picture, if you can believe it. Um, so iGraph doesn't understand the spatial aspect. It doesn't know where these nodes are. It captures the connections perfectly. So this sort of this um, little diamond intersection bit here, that's represented by the nodes 9, 11, 10, and 12, but it's you know, somewhere completely different on the picture than it should be spatially. So the solution to this is SF networks, which combines the power of SF and iGraph, puts it together and allows you to create spatial networks. Um, so this is the link with the, for the SF networks articles. Um, and I highly encourage you to go and check those out. Um, they are amazing. Um, so basically, I, I think of SF networks as a kind of superhero that combines the powers of iGraph and SF. And this is how SF networks would represent that same network structure from earlier. So it's got the connectivity information that's represented by the dots or the nodes. And it's also got the spatial information. Um, what's also interesting about it is that it, um, it's intelligent. It understands when something is intersecting and when it's not intersecting. So the red and purple lines crossing in the middle, that might be an overpass or, a, or an underpass. Um, and you can't actually turn into the red road from the purple one or vice versa. So there's no connection, even though they cross each other spatially. Okay. So now we come to sort of the big part of item two on the, on the outline, which is let's dive into 
SF networks. So a brief overview of what we'll be doing is to look at uh, a routing application. If we've got some points in different um, areas and we want to calculate routes between them. So firstly, we'll have a quick look. I won't go into it too much, um, but we'll have a quick look at how to actually get this road networks data. Um, so again, keeping with, a, with the sort of trend of open, free, uh, crowdsourced kind of stuff, uh, software and data, I'm a big fan of OpenStreetMaps, where you can freely get uh, roads data and where you can contribute as well. It's kind of like the Wikipedia of road network data. Then I'll show you how to get that downloaded data into an SF networks object, um, how to clean the road network, um, preserving distance. And when we work through the example, you'll see how that's important and how you, that can be messed up. Um, and then we'll look at some SF networks functionality. So clustering nodes um, and routing. Contraction, I don't think I actually really went to, but I'll mention it when we get there. And then we'll look at how to visualize results as well. So SF Networks doesn't talk directly to ggplot, but because it's very easy to convert an SF Networks object into an SF object, and that talks to ggplot, um, you can visualize it using the full powers and beauty and artistry of ggplot. Um, and if you want a quick visualization without converting it to SF, then autoplot works very well, the autoplot function in SF Networks. Okay, so I have prepared an R um, markdown file. Um, so um, I just want to ask, how does this work? Do we take questions in bits or do we do it, all of them at the end? What would you say? What do you prefer, Renata? Um, Are you happy to take a question if someone? Mm, yes, I am. I'm just not going to be able to see the chat, so. Okay, um, I'll give you a shout if there's a question. Can you zoom, make it a little bit bigger? Oh boy. So that I it's sort so. of, I don't, I'm not sure how to. I don't know. Right I'm trying right. to. Mm, that's not um, helping. I can open, open it in R. Or open in browser. Then you can probably. Okay, let's see. Zoom. Um, I'm just checking. Okay, I can, in fact, do that. Okay. Is that yeah, that's, that's great. That's awesome. Very good. Okay, great. Okay, so if anyone wants to ask questions as we go, you're welcome to. Um, otherwise, you can hold it to the end, whichever you prefer. I'll give you a shout or not if there's something. Okay, cool. And yeah, please also let me know if anything is unclear because um, I just I don't want to continue rambling on. That's the one disadvantage of online, is that I can't look into people's eyes and feel whether they're following me or whether I'm going on my own tangent here. Okay, so the first thing um, that we're going to look at briefly is the OSM extract package, simply because if you want to use a road network, you need to get a road network from somewhere. So you can, in SF networks, define your own um, network. You can create it from the ground up by literally giving the coordinates of points and lines and sticking them together. So that's what I did to create that network visualization um, that I was showing earlier. Well. I didn't do that. The guy who created the SF Networks vignette did that. And there's lots of details on how to do that um, in his articles. But that's not really practical if you want to analyze a road network. Um, you would much rather just import the existing road network um, from somewhere. So OpenStreetMaps um, provides road networks that are free. And the OSM extract package is one of the packages. I don't think it's the only one, um, but it's the one that I used that lets you get this information into R. So um, there's a little bit of code here, which I won't go into too much, um, but the idea is that there are several different providers of, um, of roads and they don't all um, cover the entire globe. So before you extract roads from OSM, you want to check um, what providers are available. And you want to see how they've basically split up the world into regions. Um, you can plot it. Um, I will share the code. So if at this point, because this isn't crucially important to the SF networks, I'm just skipping over this a little bit, um, but it is there. 
and we can see that okay they do at least cover south africa and a large part of the ocean apparently um you can check this using this oe match thing to see whether they actually have um roads from south africa i've decided to use this provider there are a couple here um this one and this one as well even though it's open street map france they do provide roads in south africa this bb bike thingy doesn't because it's like bike routes which we don't really have um, so i decided to use this provider i can see here that they do have roads in south africa um, if you call this oe match pattern function and you search for south africa then you see that there are in fact two providers providing roads um, but i decided to go with geofabric um, so here's the code to download it, which I won't do now because I already downloaded it earlier. Um, but if you want to run this, you can uncomment this and just provide your own path and then it will download the data for you. Okay. Um, one thing to do, um, and it's also in, it's explained very nicely in the OSM extract um, resources that I also linked to in my presentation. Um, you do need to convert the format between how it's downloaded using OSM extract and before you can pull it into SF networks. You need to um, convert it to this sort of, um, into a shapefile. <clears throat> so a shapefile is one of the two big formats for using spatial data. Um, shapefile is the ESRI um, proprietary format, but just because the format is proprietary doesn't mean only their software uses it um, R uses it, QGIS uses it, everyone does. And the other format is GeoJSON, um, which I haven't worked with that much yet, but it sounds pretty cool. So what I did in order to change this information into a shape file was I literally opened this um, file in QGIS, and then I cropped the data so that it would only include roads in Gauteng. So I've got this here. So, um, this sort of in the background this is qgis by the way this this program um the green stuff in the background is um Gauteng province and if i take away the roads um these little areas are wards so the administrative units they're smaller than a municipality i also have municipalities there they are um so they're smaller than municipalities and i was interested in routing between specific wards so this information um, is not from OSM networks, uh, OSM. Um, this is from uh, South African Statistical Association, whatever. I mean, Stats SA, not SASA. It's from Stats SA. It's official data. It's also freely available. So um, if you want to do this workflow on another part of the world, just go to their official website um, or any other administrative area um, site there are a lot of those that are freely available the roads are from um, open street maps which i downloaded with osm extract and so i think let me just see somewhere i think i've got the roads of the whole country it's going to take a moment but um so this this dark green stuff that's uh, appearing on the screen um that is what was the full data set that i downloaded from um osm using the osm extract package and that is what you will get if you use the code um so it's a lot you don't necessarily want all of it um so i within qgis because i could then i could pull in the wards data set um, I just cropped this rows data so that I would only have the roads in Gauteng. I'm also only displaying some of them here. Um, there are more roads, but otherwise it just becomes decluttered. So um, one reason that I would recommend doing this using QGIS um, or any other similar software, once you've imported the data and before you start using it in R, is because um, this allows you to really explore the data and make sure that it is what you think it is. Make sure that it's projected correctly and that everything is there. Um, because 
this is one thing that you can't really do in R unless you're really good at visualizing things is to, you know, really have an interactive plot like this, that's this big um, and that doesn't crash your computer. That's what GIS software is made to do. So I would absolutely recommend doing this before you start using the roads data because sometimes something can go wrong. It's not what you wanted. And then you've checked it before you started your analysis. Okay, so um, let me get the right. Here we go. So once that's done, we want to import and pre-process the data. Okay, the other thing that I did there in, uh, in QGIS was that I exported the data um, as a shapefile. So that's important because you needed to be in this .shp shapefile format. I do believe R can work with other formats as well, but I know it works with shapefiles. I know it's happy with them. So firstly, um, I imported the shapefile data. So I'm, I import the administrative units, that green background stuff, um, as well as the road network. Um, and it's not possible to import a shapefile directly into SF networks. You can import it in R and then you um, make it an SF object. And then we do some pre-processing and then make it an SF networks object. So the first thing that I did is I just read in using this ST read, which is from the SF package. I just read in the wards um, and then I read in the roads as well. So just replace this with your own path, obviously, if you want to run it. And it gives you some um, information as well. You can see here, it says simple feature collection. So essentially it's an SF um, object. And you also see that I gave it this name, this .wgs name. So that's just because um, of the projection. So when you're working with spatial data, whether or not it's projected is really important um, because so data can be unprojected, in which case they're just sort of, I mean, they're there, they're spatial, but if you want to try and measure distance or something and it's not projected, um, it might not work the way that you expect. But it gives us some nice information. And then I also plot it. So using ggplot, because ggplot and SF are good friends, um, I'm just plotting some, the subregion that I'm going to be looking at in this example. So here are some wards. I think they're from Johannesburg. And then I add the roads. So these are the roads um, that are cropped to this area. And you can change the colors and play around as you like. Um, I decided to go with purple. So then before really working with it, then we get to this projection, projection bit that I mentioned. So projecting the data is optional um, if you're going to be working exclusively within SF networks. SF networks is a new package. So there's, there's sort of a trend in the spatial world to move away from having to project data. So that's essentially, having to convert your like three-dimensional coordinates on a globe onto a flat area because you always lose accuracy when going from a 3D thing to a, to a flat surface. So SF networks, because it's new, because there's a growing trend in the geospatial community to not have to project, it allows you to work with, um, you can literally import your data and it will work if you haven't projected it. Um, but some of the older packages, especially if you want to use FATSTAT, don't allow you to work with unprojected data. They want it flat on a flat surface. So I would recommend doing that anyway, because um, you never know, maybe you want to use your project later. Um, you know, you want to extend it and add some FATSTAT functionality, and then you'll be a bit stuck if you haven't projected it. I mean, not that stuck, you can project it at any time, but it's good practice. Okay, so here's some geographical information. If you don't know exactly what that is, don't worry. Um, you can use UTM zone 35S, this, this code. Um, you can use this for Gauteng. Um, if you go to a different part of the world, just look up what um, EPSG code you need. So that's sort of more geography stuff. Okay, so using the ST transform function, I transformed the walls and the roads. So you do need to project both, otherwise they're gonna be distorted. Um, and then I just um, plotted, a, I printed out a summary of this roads data. 
So this roads data object here is still an SF object at this point. Um, it's been projected and it's got all the data that's captured in um, OpenStreetMaps. So it's got um, the class of the road, it's got the road name, and for some of them, not for all of them, it's got the speed limit, whether it's a one way and so on. And then most importantly of all, it's got the geometry column, which, it, which is what makes it spatial. So the first thing that I decided to do here was to not keep all the roads. So if we look at this um, image here, there's a bunch of roads. There's like little residential roads, service roads, it's got footpaths, it's got everything, and you might not need all of that. So I only wanted the important roads. So I went and looked what the names were of the road categories that I wanted, and I only kept those. And then if you plot them, you can see it looks a bit more, uh, a bit less chaotic. But it, it completely depends on your application. Maybe you only want residential roads, then you only keep them. So we can't convert to SF networks yet. So there's two, still two things that you need to do before going to SF networks. The first thing is to cast your rows data to line strings. Because um, if we look here, it's all multi-line strings. And SF networks cannot handle multi-line strings. Um, at this point, it needs things to be line strings. So that's easy enough. You just cast it to a line string. Um, there is this warning, but it's not that much of a problem. Essentially, it just says that if you have a multi-line string and the speed limit is 60 kilometers um, or the name is Church Street, whatever, if you split it up, it's going to apply those attributes to each sub area. So if you had a long, a multi-line string that was called Church Street and you split it up, all the little bits are still going to be called Church Street, but that's probably correct. I can't think of a case where, um, you know, that would not be correct. So be aware of it, but don't stress too much about that warning. And then last thing that we do before converting it to SF networks is to round the coordinates. Um, so this isn't mandatory, it's just that due to the fact that um, road network data, just like any data, isn't 100% clean the moment that you get it, it can happen that you'll have someone capturing a road and having the endpoints almost, almost meet, but not quite. Um, and in that case, it will, it will look like they're not connected when they are. So if you just round the coordinates, if you don't have the precision that precise, um, then you just essentially fix any human error that can occur. And then SF networks will understand that these roads do in fact connect, even if they're five centimeters apart, um, it just sort of puts them together. Okay, so now we can convert this SF object into SF networks. And it's as easy as saying as SF network, um, then providing your data to it. And then um, so there are some options. So you can, um, you can have a directed network or an undirected one. And um, I went with an undirected network because I didn't really have information on whether roads were one way or not. I mean, there is a little bit of information here, but it's not filled in for all the roads. And even if you know that it's a one way, uh, you don't know which way is the one way. So I just decided to stick with undirected. You can, um, you can have directed road networks, but it becomes a little bit tricky um, if you've got a combination of two-way and one-way roads. You need to put in an extra step, which we're not going to do here. But that, that is all explained in the SF Networks articles. It can be done. It just seems like needless work. Um, then there's another option, which we'll look at at the end, which is called length as weight. So essentially, you can represent this road network as a weighted graph, which is what I'm going to have by the end. Um, and you can set the length as the weight, but it doesn't make sense to do that in the beginning because during data cleaning, we'll be chopping up some roads, we'll be fusing some roads together and so on. So the length will be changing. And then by the end of it, if you set this length as weight true in the beginning, um, the lengths have changed. So that's not really useful. You want to do this right at the end, as we will. So just the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because when I was getting started with SF networks, I put this in the end 
and uh, in the beginning and then when I would get to the end of the cleaning process um, because the weight uh, because the lengths have changed I ended up with some NAs in places that surprised me I even contacted one of the people who worked on the package and told him that I was getting NAs and he didn't know what was going on so just uh, save yourself a headache and only set this length as weight equal true when you're done cleaning. Okay, so once we've made the roads into an SF Networks object, um, it prints out a really nice little summary of what is going on. So this is also important to check. I've, I've spent many hours staring at uh, printouts like these to make sure that the data was being stored correctly. So it tells you how many nodes you have and how many edges. It tells you, so this is the projection data. Um, you need to make sure that it is it matches an EPSG code that makes sense to you. And it's also going to tell you whether it's directed or undirected. It's going to tell you whether it's a multi-graph or a simple graph. You want it to be a simple graph, and we'll deal with that in a moment. And it also tells you how many components there are. So those are basically separate little road networks that don't connect to each other. So there it gives you the node data. So essentially SF Networks stores nodes and um, edges, so intersections and line endpoints and the lines together in one object. And it's just making this clear, saying, okay, these are the nodes um, and it's these are the first six nodes and these are the edges. And you can see in the edge um, data, it has captured or it's preserved the information from OpenStreetMaps including the road class, the name, um, and some of this other information that we won't be using here, but you can if you want to. And it's telling you here as well, um, the edges of the line strings and the uh, nodes of the points. So it's very clear and self-explanatory. Okay, so next we get to data cleaning. So we've technically already done a little a little cleaning step, which was that um, rounding coordinates step that we did earlier. Um, the reason that I did this here is because this rounding coordinates thingy needs to be done before you make it an SF Networks object. You can't do this once it's an SF Networks object because then it's already got its um, connection information set up. So you can't then tell it, oh, these two nodes were actually the same all along, um, unless you want to do a lot of extra manual work. Um, because it's already formed these points. So this step needs to happen before the time. Again, something which I didn't understand and which cost me a lot of time trying to figure out why it wasn't working. Okay, so the first step, once we get to the proper cleaning and everything is in SF networks is to simplify the road network. So the initial road network is a multigraph, which contains like some loops and things that you don't really want in your graph and which might mess up some graph calculations um, if you want to use them. I can't think of a specific example, but it can mess with the, with the mathematics of the graph calculations. So this is easy enough. Um, so this is the roads, my SF networks object that I created here. And then I do a couple of steps here. So the first thing to do is to activate the edges. So this is important because um, SF networks objects have these um, have this sort of dual nature, where they're at at, this, at once points and lines. You need to make sure that the right component, the points or the lines, um, is activated. So because this is something that's related to the edges, we want to remove multiple edges and loops. Um, you need to make sure that the edges are activated first. Otherwise, it's going to try. It might try to perform calculations on the nodes and get confused. So um, here I'm arranging it by edge length. Um, so essentially this means that when I remove some of the um, superfluous uh, redundant edges, it will keep the shortest one. So you can you don't need to, to, to put the step in if you don't want to keep the shortest one specifically, if you just want to keep a random one. So then we filter out the edges that are multiple and we filter out the edges that are loops to make it a simple graph. And then we print the simple graph and we can see that it is now an undirected simple graph. Not that much has changed. I don't actually, let's go back and see. Two, two, six, eight edges, two, two, six, one edges. So it is 
actually removed seven edges. It won't have changed the notes, but it's removed seven um, redundant edges and it's, it's now a simple graph. The rest of the information will be mostly the same, but you can see here that it now says that the edge data is active. And that's a result of the activate edges thing that we did a moment ago. Right, so the next step is to subdivide edges. So this is necessary because SF networks only creates nodes at the endpoints of lines. So normally the way that you're supposed to capture um, information in um, OpenStreetMaps and any other sort of thing, uh, similar software is you're supposed to say if you've got a like a line, uh, a road and another one that intersects it, you need to capture those sections of the road as separate lines so that it's clear what's going on. They'll have the same attributes, they'll have the same road name and everything, but you do need to, to capture them as separate lines. But people don't always do that. So sometimes they'll just make lines that actually intersect, but they're not capturing that information. And then there's no way for SF networks to know that. So it can happen that roads actually do connect at some kind of interior point. So a road is making some kind of funny squiggle and another road is also making a funny squiggle at the same point, or it's maybe ending there, and then they do actually connect. And the subdivide function will pick that up and will divide the roads at those points. So it's not completely perfect if people have created two straight lines crossing without any sort of bend in them at that point, then the SF networks still can't help you, but I guess no data will ever be 100% clean. What it does do, which is, which is great, is it does not destroy underpasses and overpasses. So if under and overpasses have been captured correctly, they will be a straight line passing a, another straight line and SF networks won't artificially create an intersection there. So subdividing is also a very simple operation. It's literally this one line. Um, and again, it gives us this, this assumes attributes are constant over geometries warning, which just means if you split a 60 kilometer per hour road in two, the two halves will still be 60 kilometers per hour. They, the attributes will be the same. Um, this is just to plot the over, over and under passes. So you can actually do that. And this is just to prove my point that it has not created points um, at over and under passes. These are still preserved. Obviously, you do need to have a little bit of trust in the original digitizer and hope that they didn't completely mess up the way that they were capturing the road networks. So the next step is then to smooth pseudo nodes. So you might not, depending on who captured the road um, network and how accurate it is, the step is optional. So pseudo nodes are um, essentially nodes that don't define the connectivity. They don't contribute connectivity information. So that's essentially a node um, or like a connection that exists, but there's, there's only one road. Um, there's, a, there's a road and there's a point on the road, essentially. So it's splitting a road into two, but it's not like you can turn off at that point to go anywhere else. Um, you might want to leave this in if your road network has been captured in a way that the attributes change. So if you've got a road that's 60 kilometers an hour and then there's a a node which defines a point at which the speed limit changes, then you might want to leave in the pseudo nodes. Otherwise, um, you can remove them because they do produce complexity a lot. Um, and this is simply uh, done by converting your previous uh, road network to a spatial smooth object. I didn't actually print, print the road network out again, but it did, trust me, it removed a lot of nodes. So just for instance, um, this one in this uh, previous overpasses and, and underpasses one, we can see there are a couple of nodes on the leftmost line that you can't turn off on into any other road there. So it would have removed those. And then I believe this is the last, yes, this is the last cleaning step is to simplify intersections. This is again something that happens when people capture road networks where roads at intersections, maybe it's a big intersection and then they don't um, capture it as two roads crossing. They actually have little four little um, lines. I had this in my presentation. Um, 
So let's see that. So these four little dots um, that are next to each other, that type of thing can happen. This is an intersection. These roads, um, the light purple roads and the blue one and the red one, they just go into each other. These four little tiny roads are not contributing any information to your road network. They're just clutter. So that is removed in this, um, in this step. And this is, this is quite an interesting bit of code. It's, it's not complicated, but it's interesting. So um, I won't go necessarily into all the detail here because time, um, but it essentially clusters points in Euclidean space. It picks up which points are close to each other, and then it checks whether they are um, connected, whether they're on the same road network or not. Because if they're not connected, um, the points can be right next to each other, but there's no way to travel between them. And then they actually are representing unique spatial and connectivity information that you don't want to remove. So you'll need the dbscan library. That's just a method for clustering points in Euclidean space. Um, it's important to activate the nodes again, because they um, it's clustering nodes now, not edges. So you need the nodes activated. Then you cluster them together. And then um, make sure that they're also um, connected to the network. Okay. So that's done um, here using this group components thing. So the components refers to the different um, little road networks. And then finally, we contract the road network. So that basically means that you, you put the, the nodes together that are clustered and then slightly move the edges so that they actually connect to this node. Otherwise, the edges are going to stop in the middle of nowhere. So that's an important step. So then that's basically the road network cleaned. The very last step is to recreate the SF networks object. And this is an optional step. It's necessary if you want to use the length of roads as the weight, which is what I wanted to do in my, um, in my case. So um, that is, this is a workaround that I found. I, if anyone plays around with this um, package and finds a better way to do it, I'd be happy because it feels a bit hacky. Um, but essentially, because the lengths have changed throughout the cleaning process, um, and I now want to make the lengths explicit at the end, I first convert my, um, my final road uh, SF networks object back to an SF object. So using this ST as SF function. And then I converted back to an as to an SF network object. Um, this time setting the length as weight equals true option. And it will warn you that it's overwriting these columns. That's that's fine. It might be renumbering the nodes. Um, so just don't set your heart on having the, the node numbers be exactly the same, but materially it doesn't make a difference. Okay, so then we can look at the results of cleaning and see whether we agree as well, because again, this isn't necessarily perfect. So here we've got the original road networks for one of one of the wards. Um, this, I'll scroll up all the way. Um, this sort of the central ward here, just the roads for that one. So there it is before cleaning and there it is after cleaning. And I um, wish I could show them side by side, but I'll just have to scroll up and down. So this road here on the, on the right-hand side um, has been simplified a bit, quite a bit, especially at the top. There are way fewer um, nodes that really don't do anything. They just, um, they're repeating the same information. Um, this, will, this will happen a lot, especially if, as I did, you're removing some roads. So these probably originally contained useful information. They're probably connected to residential roads or something, but because those roads aren't there, these nodes are now kind of redundant. And also in the center of the sort of urban area, it's removed a lot of these um, redundant little nodes and simplified everything. So we, I can see that it's removed this piece of line over here. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why. So I'm not considering that a problem um, because I've also just, I've cropped this from the original clean data set. 
So I would go if I was doing this seriously, I would go and see whether it's still there, whether it's been removed or whether it just has to do with the way that I, that I cropped this for display purposes. But in general, you will lose some information during cleaning. I think that's a general statistical principle, um, but it's probably worth it given the amount of, of computation time you'll save. And here we have our, our roads. So this is the, the pre-clean version. Um, and we've got the number of nodes and edges here. And then we've got the roads.clean, which is our final clean road network. And there are way fewer nodes and edges. So we've gone from having 2,400 nodes to having 1,300. And we've gone from having 22,000 plus edges to having only, um, not 22,000, 2,200, to having 1,700 plus plus edges. So it has uh, removed a lot of information, most of which will have been redundant. So that's great. If the attributes of the roads are very important to you, like the exact speed limit and so on, um, firstly, probably OpenStreetMaps is not the, the place to get your data because it doesn't have the speed limit um, information for a lot of the roads. But if something like the road names or something is super important, then you might need to be quite careful with this cleaning because it might, especially when it starts um, removing pseudo nodes, um, then it might mess things up. So just be careful with the, with the removing pseudo node step and um, deciding whether or not to, to do it. If the individual attributes are important, then it might be safer to leave that step out. Okay, so that's the end of the data cleaning bit. Um, now we get to visualization, and then after that, we will have a look at some applications once you have the clean um, road network. Okay, so visualizing roads, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are two ways of doing this. Um, you can use the autoplot function that's, that works with SF networks that doesn't require you to do any other steps. So you can just say autoplot, I've got this, um, this roads clean one is the is the cropped cleaned version of this network and it just gives you this visualization it's got the coordinates there and it's got the edges and the nodes and that's it it can't really be customized you can't add colors or, or change the thickness of the lines or anything like that but it's a perfectly adequate visualization um, during your workflow if you want to make it pretty afterwards um, then you need to convert it to an, to an SF object. So um, that's what this bit of code does. So it, um, you need to activate the edges first, again, because you want to plot the edges and then convert it. And then you can use ggplot um, straightforwardly enough and you can plot your roads. And that's also great if you want to plot the roads on a background as we do here, plotting it on the background of the wards because with auto plots um, in SF networks, SF networks only stores the network object. It is not aware of the background, the wards, the country that it's in or anything. So if you want to make sophisticated visualizations, um, just take it to SF and use ggplot essentially. Um, we can also plot the nodes. So if you use the same code, but you activate the nodes instead of the edges, then it will plot the nodes. Um, and you can plot them both as well um, on one thing. So then it looks, it can look quite like autoplot, but there's more information. You can change the colors and customize it the way that you want. Okay, so now that we have a clean road network and we can plot it, we can look at some applications. So there are a lot of applications. Again, fully encourage you to go and read all the SF Networks articles and documentation. They're very detailed. Um, but what we'll be looking at here is something that I've been doing for part of my PhD, which is to um, cluster the nodes and then um, sort of take representative points, essentially, in each ward that are on the network, and then to do a routing application between them. So the, the idea behind this is if, say you want to calculate how long it's gonna take someone to move from one area to another, or at least what the distance is. 
then if you want to, if you're going to do um, routing from every single point in one ward to every single point in another ward, that's going to become quite computationally expensive because there are quite a few, I don't know exactly how many, but there are a lot. Um, if you want to get a representative point in the ward, then you could take like a random sample of the intersections, uh, for instance, but as we all know, random samples don't guarantee accurate sampling. So you could also cluster the points. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing here. So there are a couple of different algorithms for clustering nodes on weighted graphs. Um, one of the popular ones is Louvain clustering. It works. That's basically uh, that's basically the reason for using it. It works quite well. Um, there's also one called InfoMap and some others. Um, I haven't explored all the different ones in R because I, based on the literature, I decided to go with Louvain. Um, and it's also very easy to use. So here I'm just taking the, the clean road network well, of, the, of the one ward, activating the nodes, and then just adding this Louvain as factor group, uh, Louvain um, step. So this assigns the nodes to clusters based on the Louvain clustering algorithm. And here you can plot the different clusters. So then I calculate the cluster centroids. So because the idea behind what I'm trying to do here is not just to cluster the nodes, but to take a representative node in that cluster. So this is to reduce the number of roads that I'll be using, uh, nodes that I'll be using for routing. So um, simply enough, you can take the, the centroid um, in Euclidean space and then just project it onto the road network. And then that's the, the closest you can easily get to a, a centroid of the cluster that's actually still on a road. So um, this is just a little bit of code that calculates the cluster centroids. Uh, apologies, I'm sure there are cleaner ways of doing this, um, but this is how I code. And um, essentially I'm just obtaining the, the centroids in Euclidean space. And that's what I'm doing in the first, first bit. So here I've just got the centroids and they're not like this one, for instance, and this one, you can see they're not actually on the roads. Um, so this is just the first step. Um, you can then project them onto the, onto the nearest node. You can also project them onto the nearest edge if you want to, um, but then it's going to create a new node um, or you might need to create a new node in there and that will change your road network. So it depends on what you want to do. So here I'm just, um, uh, let me see. I think I did the code for this earlier. Oh, there we go. So this is the project. This is the projection bit. So what I'm plotting on this on this graph, which is the Euclidean centroids, that's just um, the the actual centroids. But if you want to project it onto the nearest node, then you use this um, st nearest feature, and then you can then you obtain the, the nearest node. And there they are. So these these points have now been slightly shifted they are now corresponding to a node on the network. And these are my representative nodes within each ward. So the next step is to calculate the routes between them. And so just a note on routing in SF networks, um, it supports one-to-one -one routing. So that's from one origin to one destination. And it supports one-to-many routing, which is from one origin to many uh, destinations. What it does not support is many-to-many -many routing. So if you give it a couple of origins and a couple of destinations, it won't be able to, um, to plot those for you. I don't know if they're working on that or if they've just decided it's too complicated. Um, but this, the package is still being developed. Um, it's released and everything, but they are still improving it. So maybe that will be a thing one day. Um, at this point, what it does do for um, many-to-many -many routing is um, it does, it does um, calculate many-to-many -many distances. So if you don't want an exact route, if you're happy with just the distance of the shortest path, um, between multiple origins and multiple destinations. It calculates that, no problem. It will um, return it for you in a, in a matrix. 
Um, and that was actually fine for me. But if you want some nice visualizations, then um, you'll have to do one origin uh, at a time. So if you want to calculate the, um, the cost matrix between multiple um, destinations and origins, then you can use this ST network cost function. So this OD centroids is going to be essentially the um, cost matrix between um, the, the centroids and this OD all. I'll switch to R in a moment to show you the matrices so that I'm not just talking in the air. Um, this is getting the cost between all the points. So you can see that if you want to use only some points, you do need to actually specify your origins and your destinations. So in my case, the centroids um, matrix here, centroids column four stores um, all, all of these, these star, starry points. Um, but you could, also, you could also have specified fewer, more specific ones. The origins and destinations can be different. They can be different amounts. Anything goes, it's all, all allowed. If you want to calculate the cost uh, matrix based on all the points, you literally just need to put in your um, road network as a um, the only parameter to the to the function. So if we go to R, I'm actually not sure if I have run this recently. Oh, there we go. So let me just. I can't see what I'm what I'm doing with all the screen sharing thingies that are happening. Um, okay, so this is the this the sen the matrix that's based only on the centroids, and it's um, it's fairly smallish. It's got fifteen, so there are fifteen um, clusters, and hence fifteen cluster centroids, and it's a it's a smallish matrix. Um, the diagonals will be zero because obviously the distance between a location and itself is zero. And the um, so these distances are all in meters, incidentally. And if it says inf, that means that there's no there's no path at all between two points. It means that they are on different components of the graph. And in our case, that would be um, this these fellows here. So this one and that one, they're not connected to the others. So if you if you land there, you're kind of stuck. Um, but what's nice is that it doesn't break. It just says, OK, well, the distance is infinity. You'll never get there. And if we look at this OD all matrix, that's a lot bigger. That's There's 231 points in this uh, nodes in this network. And that's just one ward after cleaning. So probably not recommended, depending on your application, but still. Um, and well, there's a bunch of them that are in because they're on different components. So but this to me is a, is a mini motivation of why I would only want representative points and not all of them. But that's essentially what it looks like. And then you can use those values um, in your further application. But if we've got one-to-one -one or one-to-many routing, I'll, I'll just look at one-to-one -one routing here because one-to-many will be the same uh, idea. Then it can calculate the exact shortest path between nodes. So not just the distance, but it will actually store the path. Um, and then you can plot that path and you can see what it looks like. So what's nice about that as well is that the, if, if you want to calculate the shortest um, path between two nodes, they don't actually need to be nodes on the network. So up until this point and for the remainder of this example, I'm only working with the nodes that are on the network. But if you've somehow got points, if you want to specify coordinates that are not on the network, SF networks can still calculate the shortest path between them. It will just find the shortest node corresponding to that, um, as we did manually going from this image to this one. It will do that in the background for you if you specify a point that's not on the network. So in this example, I'm just taking two random um, of these uh, centroid representative nodes. Um, I'm getting the path. So you can, you can get the path between them using this ST network paths. You just supply the network and the two nodes. Then you get these edges because that's relevant for plotting them. And you get this, this uh, plot path object. I just want to see whether I actually needed that before I'm taking you through irrelevant code. I think I only needed the edges, actually. 
I think this may have been a little bit of redundant code, but this edges is important because this is actually listing um, which edges are connected within your shortest path. And then you can plot them. And this is essentially what it's doing. So these, um, this pink and blue uh, nodes are the origin and the, um, and the destination. And this thick line here is the shortest path between them. And so you can do this for um, multiple destinations as well. It will just be from one origin. Um, in the case of an undirected graph, as we have here, technically you can also think of it as being multiple um, origins and one destination. But either way, you can't have multiple, multiple if you want to plot it nicely like this. You'll have to do it one origin at a time, essentially. So that's my, that's my example um, and my discussion, essentially, of SF networks. This is just some of the stuff that you can do with it. Um, there's really a lot. Um, I believe I had the articles. This is one of my most visited tabs in, in the world. Um, <laughs> is the this um, these vignettes, and so that's um, on Luke van Amir's GitHub, and he's got a bunch of articles, and there are so many cool stuff that you can do with it, um, including like spatial morphers, for example, for example, um, which is like this uh, somewhere he shows you can contract the road network like this, so you can make new edges that actually go between representative points. Um, you can you can do all sorts of cool stuff, adding in edges and plotting amazing things. Um, I haven't done all of these, so I can't describe them accurately. Um, it can also reduce your network to only keep the shortest paths. That's also something that it can do. So there's a there's a lot of other things that you can additionally do as well. Um, so I encourage anyone who's interested. Um, also, it doesn't have to be road networks, right? So it just has to be a network of lines. The most common application by far is going to be roads. But if you've got like rivers or trail or train tracks or um, whatever, any kind of, of linear connected um, data set, SF networks will work very happily with that um, data. And... There we go. That is it from my side. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Uh, any questions? Nicely done, Renata. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, if anyone has any talks, uh, talks, questions, you're welcome to ask them. Uh, Renata Robert asks if we can make the slides and your code available. Can we put them somewhere? Are they already somewhere? Yes. Uh, they're not already somewhere, um, but okay, I'm happy to we'll share them. Plan. Okay, we'll make a plan. We'll put the links on the meetup. Um, and it was recorded, Robert. So we will put it on the Our Ladies channel, Our Ladies Global, Babash, on YouTube. Yes, we will put it on we'll the Our link. Ladies Global. And then I usually pop the link in the meetup as well. Uh, so just watch out for the comments. I usually put it in there. Uh, Renata Sriram has a, would like to ask what your PhD is about. Good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it involves networks. Um, so um, at this point, uh, so this research that I've shown here has to do with actually calculating um, travel time. So this example used distance because I didn't have access to traffic data at the time, um, but it, it, basically calculates travel time between um, adjacent um, administrative units. So I used wards as in this example, but it can scale to municipalities or anything. Um, and so it's trying to get an accurate idea of what's the general travel time from this one origin to this one destination based on sort of all the possible routes or, uh, you know, representative routes that people could take to sort of try and get a a simpler transport model because those are really difficult to simulate essentially. So I think where it started was uh, Renata and I on our COVID, uh, COVID modeling team and we were, tr were trying to do spatial uh, disease modeling at ward level. And South Africa has got 4,300 odd wards so it's very very computational 
Um, and if you if you do spatial analysis, you need con connectivity matrices. So that means you've got a matrix of size 4,300 and 4,300 and the computations just become overwhelming. So her approach is actually just to sort of do more logical steps to do this in a much more computational way. That's the that's not what she's showing you here, but that's what she's working on ultimately. She does know yeah, that I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> no, 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 I do know that. <laughs> but we're also going to be looking, what, what I'm quite excited about is some other network stuff that we're going to be looking at in the near future, um, which will still be related, but it's not part of this, like this thing exactly. Um, mm. And that's going yeah. to be delving more into like network statistics and mathematics and stuff. So um, my head is already halfway there. So <laughs> so there were some questions earlier, just when you started, Renata, about what uh, books, let me just read the questions got up there, some good books on spatial and spatial with R. So I, we put some links there, Bash and I, but I don't know if you have any resources that you found very helpful as you've been going. Um, so only really um, the ones that I've uh, posted or that are in the presentation are the ones that I have mainly used. Um, I didn't really need ex uh, additional background on spatial stuff because I've been working with uh, GIS and that kind of way of thinking since undergrad. Um, and I don't remember using specific textbooks. Maybe I've just forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there aren't really specific resources um, that I would recommend beyond these ones, but I'm sure the other books are also great. Yeah, I think there's, like I tried to say in the, in the chat, but I don't know if I made it clear enough, is there are books with spatial and R and even, uh, you know, R books that have been written and some of these links will look like that. Um, but then there's pure theoretical spatial sets, which also have a number of books. So it depends really what angle you want to come from. Um, but happy if you want to pop us an email, we can always uh, direct you in more detail if you need. That's no problem. Um, any other question? Oh, Stefano has a question there, Renata. Is it man mandatory to round the coordinates or is there some sort of fuzzy threshold like in other software, e.g. PG routing? Um, so I don't think there's really options for thresholding once you're in SF networks. So um, if you want to do something else beforehand while it's still in SF, then maybe there's different things that you can do. But once it's in SF networks, essentially um, the, the locations of these nodes are more or less fixed. Um, they're connect the edges are connected or they're not, um, if I understood the question correctly. Yeah, Stefan, you're welcome to make a follow-up if you need um yeah but these are fixed roads are fixed to a certain extent <laughs> so <laughs> they should be they should stay there i would i would say just on the on the resources thing again um what i would recommend above all things is to dive in with an application um even if you if you think you don't know what what you're doing um i uh, when i was i'll just share a little personal testimony here, I got started with this stuff and I was sort of looking at it and thinking this is complex, complicated. And this was in like August at some point. And then um, Inga told me, so you're submitting a, a paper at the end of uh, September to the SASA competition. And I was like, okay, um, I guess I am. And I'm really, really glad <laughs> that, um, that I was volunteered to do that because it just sort of forced me to start working on it because you can sit with the stuff, especially if you're not that familiar with um, spatial things. Like I'm familiar with spatial, but graphs were, were kind of new, um, not completely, but kind of. And if once you start working with it, physically plotting it, printing out the, the networks and how many edges and nodes and things there are, then it's much easier to understand the theory as well. Because there is obviously the trap of wanting to read the theory and wanting to understand the theory and then you sort of just get stuck and overwhelmed there and it, mm -hmm. it's more difficult to become practical. So my personal recommendation is figure out what you want to do in broad terms and then start researching how to do it because it makes mm -hmm. everything a lot easier. Absolutely. Uh, Kome has got a question. I, I don't I, I don't know how to answer it. I'm definitely going to pass it to you. How do I create isochrones with SF networks? 
I think that's in, ooh, I think it's in vignette four or five. I think they do that um, in this in this articles thing. I have, I feel like it was done somewhere. I know I saw it in another routing package as well. Um, I haven't done it myself, but I'm, I think it, I think it, if it's going to be anywhere, it's going to be in four or five um, of these articles. So I would recommend um, going to check those out. The other package that it's in, um, that isochrones are in are CPP routing. So I know that one lets you create isochrones as well. And then Sriram has another question. Probably travel modes, specific travel times will make a difference for your research. Any thoughts in that direction, even for the spread of COVID? Yeah, definitely. So I'm not really looking at, um, at different modes of transport. So I'm basically um, looking at roads specifically. The advantage is that most travel in South Africa happens along roads. So um, even, you know, public transport, that's like buses, they're still on, on roads. Um, and there's a huge um, sort of taxi industry, which is all using the roads. So my idea is to look at roads, to look at distances and times, sort of traffic information, um, but not really, not really other modes of travel at this point. Um, yeah, and I think the difficulty in that, remember or not, when we first started looking at it, was to get that data of taxi yes. routes, bus routes. It's it's very badly documented. And I mean, trail, oh, I mean yeah. Mm. train tracks as well like i tried mm. to find out where are the passenger like routes for trains in south africa and it was literally impossible um the information just isn't there unfortunately in a in a spatial data format that you can access obviously one yes. could you know manually go and find them on google maps and stuff but that's not really practical no. um see no, and I, I, the, I think, Suram, the other hidden question you've got there is that in different modes of transport, there's higher, more likely or higher risk of uh, contracting COVID, like sitting in a taxi or sitting in a train. That's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. But at the moment, we're more mo looking about how people, how much or how many people move. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this information would feed into, you know, like a larger sort of COVID model, which has other um, uh, other ways of simulating the actual spread of COVID, not within the transport itself. But that is a good, like, that is a good point, legitimately. Um, I just don't even want to think about how I would implement that at this point. It's true, if you have any ideas, welcome to pass them on. <laughs> Join us. Any more questions? Sorry, I posted a little uh, a link while Renato was talking up there about um, uh, a, a plenary by Pabesma. He's the SF Networks guy, uh, not SF Networks, SF package. Um, and it's it, if projections are sort of overwhelming and how do you choose a projection, it's a very nice plenary just to explain it to the, the layman um, or even the non-layman. Uh, Serum says the municipalities have that data. Yes, but Serum, then you have to know the right person in the right place and have drawn enough blood. <laughs> <You know>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> We've done that too. We've done that too for some data. Yes. So yeah, I'm sure it is available. It's just not um, made publicly available in a nice way. All right. Last chance for questions, comments. Ah, three Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's a question from Justine. I'll, we'll do the last question because I think we'll probably need to uh, finish off. Do these SF networks apply to ecology and social networks? I'm not sure about social networks um, because there's no real, I mean, I mean, there might be a spatial aspect. Um, typically the literature that I've seen on social networks don't, aren't really spatial. So mm. I don't, I think you could do your social network stuff in iGraph. Um, because it's it's excellent and it does allow you to have weighted graphs and everything. Um, ecological networks, it depends on what you mean. Um, I'm, I confess, I don't exactly know what that is. Um, but the point is this, so this works for something where the actual spatial shape um, of the connections between points um, is relevant. 
So if, if they exist in like physical geography, um, then SF Netbooks is suitable. If not, it's, I think you could probably still use it, but it would be sort of like, I think you could just use iGraph. It would, it would be like extra steps, I think. Mm -hmm. Ecology, I would imagine, is maybe animal movements and things like that. One of the possibilities that you could definitely use it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If you could sort of represent the routes that animals follow, then you could you could consider that to be a you could sort of make a road out of it, and then that would work. But you'd have to build your own graph, so you wouldn't be able to extract from OSM. Yeah. Yes. yes. But possible. if you have data That's from what... somewhere, then. Hmm iGraph allows you to build graphs. So if you have that data, you can build a graph and then is it, is it networks does does too. Um, also, so in this okay. in the yeah, in this um the SF network data structure, um here he shows you how to actually construct it from nodes and edges table. Um it's just most of the time you're not going to do that. Um but you can. And if you've got the data, then then you can. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Renata. You're a star, but I knew that already. But now everyone else also knows that you're a star. So <laughs> we'll invite Renata back when she's finished her PhD or near finished and she's done um, the actual research. And she, well, not that she hasn't done actual research yet, but the, the, no, but the, like final, the actual final, results. final, the actual result is. <laughs> and then she can show us what she's used it for, especially with modeling and, tran and in transport and that sort of thing um, but you'll have to watch the space for when that that happens she's only this is she's only in the middle of her phd i'm gonna say what do you think renata maybe maybe over middle way T time Depends. wise middle in terms of everything that i still want to do not middle yet <laughs> it's a journey <laughs> yes Good. Well, thanks everyone thanks everyone for joining us uh, we really appreciate you coming to the meetup and thanks, Renata, again. Thanks so much for having me. Um, this was really fun. And thanks, everyone, for asking questions and being interactive as well. Yes. I would be very happy to come and talk again. Thank you. <laughs> Have a nice thanks. evening, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, Ryan. Thank or you. a nice bye morning bye. or whatever. <laughs> Wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>